Alright guys, I've been refuted. It's over. <laughs> you, you get occasionally when we put out clear contradictions in the Bible and show the corruption that's happened over time and you get people try to refute you and you get these people, pastors, preachers, all these guys, they come out to the table at Dawah table and you'll see the videos, we, we clarify those contradictions and they're always like, we're going to be back. And then they never do come back, but anyway. Um, but you get these guys online that make refutation. Usually I just ignore it, but I saw one that I, I just thought it was hilarious. So I thought, let's, let's, let's talk about it. When we talk about the Qur'an, one of the things we present is there is only one Qur'an, and it was revealed to, Allah, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with one source, one author, which is Allah. And we present the fact that many different authors, many of them anonymous, over a large period of time, they're the ones that wrote the New Testament. The original writings, not of the New Testament, not of the Bible, but the original writings of those that witnessed the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, would be in Aramaic. But the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have are in Koine Greek. So they were written afterwards by many different authors. We make this claim. Now, there's a pastor who decided to refute us, and here's what he said. Uh, the thing about the Bible is that the Bible is written by almost 39 authors over the course of 1600 years in three different languages. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's like a closet Muslim or something, like maybe he's like an undercover Muslim, but we really appreciate him making our point. That's what we're saying. Any Christian that's watching this, please see what your pastor, Christian pastor is saying, that the Bible is not the work of just the disciples. It is not the work of Jesus. It's not work of the people that were around Jesus, but rather 39 authors over when? W was this written in the time of Jesus? No, no. He says over 1,600 years in three different languages. Uh, the thing about the Bible is that the Bible is written by almost 39 authors over the course of 1,600 years in three different languages. 39 authors. And, and you know who's not one of the authors there? God. <laughs> so, so, so this is the exact point we've been making. And he goes on to say that, that the Quran doesn't have contradictions because it only has one author. That is correct. The only mistake he makes is he says the author is Muhammad, peace be upon him. But that is impossible. I'll tell you why. He couldn't read or write. <laughs> To author a book or to author something, you have to be able to write it. And if you're saying that he didn't actually write it, but he read up on all the old scriptures to know about the old prophets and all the books of history that were there to know about all the things that are in the Quran and somehow found uh, scientific writings to know about the development of the fetus and, and, and the waves under the ocean and all these kinds of things that are in the Quran, well, he still couldn't have done that because he couldn't read or write. And that is the miracle that Allah chose to reveal His book, His words to such a man that nobody could accuse him of going and reading up a bunch of stuff and making it up because he couldn't even read or write. So this is our point. There's only one author of the Quran. And that's what the Quran says that if this was from anybody else, you would have found many mistakes and contradictions. And this pastor says, well, the reason there's no contradiction because only one author. That's it. That's what we're saying. It is the word of God. He's the only author. And that's why you don't have contradictions. And when you have 39 authors over 1600 years in three different languages developing a text, no doubt you're going to find contradictions. And we pointed out a bunch of them. And he chose a few to respond to. Many of them that are just clear numeric contradictions. He kind of just put them to a side. But he responded to a few. Let's see what he says. These are obviously two totally different genealogies because they're genealogies of two different people. And this is what this Muslim fails to understand is that in Matthew, we have the genealogy of Joseph. And in Luke, we have the genealogy of Mary. Okay. Notice the difference in language. In Matthew chapter 1, it says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Well, the word begat is actually talking about fathering a child. Whereas in Luke chapter 3, 
the wording that's used is that Jesus was as it was supposed, right? As was supposed the son of Joseph. So he's not actually the son of Joseph, who is the son, quote unquote, of Heli, and on and on. That's really interesting. Because if you say that one of the genealogies is Mary's and one is Joseph's, that doesn't make any textual sense. Look at the text. We'll get into that. But, but first off, let's just take a look at them side by side. This is what I call a vertical reading. On your screen, vertically, you see the two genealogies now. That of Luke and that of Matthew presenting the genealogy, both of them, for Jesus. Now, one of them begins with David here, that you, you see on your screen, and then has 41 generations between David and Jesus. If we don't count David and Jesus, 41 between them. The one by Matthew, on the other hand, if we start same David, same Jesus, we only have 26. 26, 41. If these are genealogies of Joseph, meaning that of Matthew, and Mary, that of Luke, that would mean Mary was much further on, meaning that you have 15 extra generations. Well, what was the age difference here? If we're seeing 15 more generations, you know, on average between 50, 70 to 100 years per, per generation, but let's take a very moderate number, 50 years. So 50 years times 15, that's 750 years that are missing in Matthew's genealogy? Come on. You know these two genealogies do not match up. They're not Mary and Joseph because first and foremost, they still wouldn't match. You have 15 additional generations. How, how was Mary uh, 750 years later? It, it doesn't make sense. What it really is, is somebody from those 39 authors, some of them anonymous, they made these up to try to tie Jesus to King David. Peace be upon them. Right? And because they did it separately, they're not the same author, they made up different genealogies. From David onwards, they're the same. How did that happen? Because the Jews knew that genealogy of David on on really well. But from David down to Jesus to try to make that connection, they made it up. And that's why they came up with absolutely different names. And Christian preachers will give us totally different answers. One problem with this suggestion, though, is that throughout his birth narrative, Luke stresses that Joseph is a descendant of David. In other words, he never mentions Mary's Davidic descent, so it would be surprising if he was giving Mary's genealogy. Another possible explanation for the two different genealogies, Kelly adopted Joseph as his own son. This would then give Joseph two genealogies. Well, if you take that Christian answer and match it with what our pastor here is saying, that this is the genealogy of Mary and Joseph, then that would mean they were brother and sister, <laughs> right? So, so it doesn't make sense. Some of them will say, no, no, these are different because they were skipping generations. Well, that doesn't make sense because the names still don't match up. And from David on, they're the same. Why do they give us different answers? In the end, we simply don't know. In the end, we simply don't know. In the end, we simply don't know. Because they don't have an answer. They make it up. Let's just prove it. Let's look at the two verses that we're looking at, and I'm going to present both of them with the original Greek, the transliteration and translation, and you can go look this up yourself. On your screen right now is the genealogy given by Matthew, and according to our friend here, uh, he says this is that of Joseph. So here you have the word begot, and, and what is the original word? Egensin. This is the Greek word, which means to bring forth, and from that people say, begot. Okay, so here Eleazar begot Matan, Matan begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, Andra. Andra is a name for a male, it means a man in Greek. The man of Mary, which translates into the husband of Mary. So no doubt this is Joseph's genealogy. Okay, he agrees, we agree, good. Because some other preacher come, no, no, this one is Mary's. Well, Mary's not a man, so it cannot be. This is Joseph, the husband of Mary's genealogy. All right, let's go now to Luke, which is the one that he's referring to. 
Now you have on your screen the Greek and English translation for Luke. Here, the word for son is tu. There is a Koinic word for daughter. So if this was the genealogy of Mary, then it should reach, then it should read, this is Jesus began his ministry at about 30 years of age, beginning as he was the supposed son of Mary, not Joseph, it should have been Mary, the Tigater, the daughter of Eli. But here it mentions Tu, which is the son. Now, could it be the son-in-law? Well, no, because if you look at the rest of the lineage in the same, if you go up all the way to 338, you will find that, that this is Enosh, the Tu of Seth, the Tu of Adam, the Tu of God. Well, none of those are son-in-laws. None of those are daughters. Those are sons. This is the word for son, not the word for daughter. It is not a reference to son-in-law because then all of those would have to be son-in-laws. And as I checked, nobody claimed Adam was a son-in-law of God or Seth was a son-in-law of Adam or Enosh was a son-in-law of Seth. So in the same chapter, in the same lineage, you can't switch up the words. Throughout his birth narrative, Luke stresses that Joseph is a descendant of David. In other words, he never mentions Mary's Davidic descent. It is evident these are both for Joseph. One mentions Andra, which is for man. One mentions the word son, too, which is clearly for a male. None of them refer to Mary. You can't just make stuff up. And that's why we get different answers from different preachers because they make it up. Some of them say it's a double name. Some of them say, no, one was a legitimate child. One was an illegitimate child. Like, I don't know. Why does the genealogy in Matthew contradict the genealogy in Luke? In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, it gives a genealogy from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. And in Luke, chapter 3, it gives a genealogy from Jesus all the way up to Adam. In Matthew, chapter 1, it says that Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. It says here that Jacob begot Joseph, which would mean that Jacob is the father of Joseph. However, in Luke chapter 3, it says that Joseph was the son of Heli, which would mean that Heli is the father of Joseph. So in Matthew chapter 1, it says that Jacob is the father of Joseph, but in Luke chapter 3, it says that Heli is the father of Joseph. So one book says that Jacob is the father, the other book says that Heli is the father, so the question is, is who's the father? Is Jacob the father, or is Heli the father, or are Jacob and Heli the same person? Well, they can't be the same person because Jacob's father is Methan, Heli's father is Methat. They have different fathers. They have different grandfathers. They have different great-grandfathers. They have different great-great-grandfathers. They have different genealogies. So how could Joseph have two different fathers with two different genealogies? Well, there's a 4th century historian by the name of Eusebius who explains this supposed discrepancy in the genealogy of Christ. In Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, in Book 1, Chapter 7, Page 21, Second Paragraph, Second Sentence, he says, Heli and Jacob were brothers by the same mother, Heli dying childless, Jacob raised up seed to him, having Joseph according to nature belonging to himself, but by law to Heli, thus Joseph was the son of both. Joseph was a illegitimate child. You know, all of these are just made up things. Look at the text. It is very clear, both of them are referring to a male, which is Joseph, with two different names of fathers. And if you look at, again, I'm going to put the vertical reading. Keep going up the generations, they're all different. It's not just like somebody made a mistake here, all the way up to David. From David onward, it's the same. It shows that these were fabricated, and that's why they contradict. In the end, we simply don't know. Now. There were some other contradictions that he just kind of skipped that I had mentioned because there were clear numeric contradictions, but he did mention one more that he had addressed, or a couple more. Let's take them. Let's have some fun with this. Clear contradiction in the Old Testament that you find in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24, 9, where Job gave the sum of the number of the people of the, to the king, David, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. How Now, who, who's, who's counting? Job. Who's he giving the count to? David the king. How many are there? 800,000 of Israel, 500,000 of Judah. Now, if we go to First Chronicles, 21, 
5. Chapter 21, verse 5. Then Job, who? Job, same person is counting, not different people. Job, I have the verse on the screen, please read it. Job gave the sum of the number of the people to King David. All Israel had was 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. Now what happened? 800,000 became 1,100,000 and 500,000 became 470,000. What's interesting is it's the same person counting, Job. What does he say about this? There's a difference between the book of the Kings versus the book of the Chronicles, where one of them talks about this many valiant men who drew sword, and this one talks about a different number. So now we went from 800,000 to 1,100,000 1, of Israel, and 500,000 to 470. Obviously, this has to do with the fact that these books are written by different authors at different times, and there is more than one way to count. Okay. <laughs> so there are more than one way to count? The same person is counting, Job! It's not a different person counting. Two plus two is four. That's the only way to count it. <laughs> right? We're not doing, you know, skipping numbers and things like this. If this was two different people counting, you could say, well, you know, one count was by somebody and somebody else counted differently. But these references are both for Job. Same person is counting, giving the account to the same King David about the same people of the people of Israel and the people of Judah. So what I do agree with him is these are different authors, meaning they gave different accounts and they made their own mistakes. Somebody probably got some numbers right. Some got them wrong because they're like he said, 39. And I think you're talking about just the New Testament. But all these different authors came together and people made mistakes. I totally understand. No problem with that. But what does that tell you? Job had to have counted one way because he's the same person. You count men, you count people, same person giving account will give the same account. But when he reported it to others, because history was lost and rewritten and things like this and different authors came, they messed up the numbers. Understandable. But what does that tell you? That the Bible is not the words of God. As he has admitted, the authors of the Bible are 39 different, some anonymous, some known authors over 1600 years. So when you have these people, they're going to make mistakes. And a book that's filled with such mistakes can't be what we rely upon for our guidance, for our hereafter, for our belief. Let's look at one more. Let's have some fun with it. Michal, the daughter of Saul, and about how it says that she had no child till the day of her death. Then he pulls out a place where it talks about her having five children, and he thinks this is a contradiction. Therefore, Mishal, the doctor of, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Mishal, doctor of Saul, the daughter of Saul. So not like there's a different Mishal, because they'll be like, oh, different one. No, no. She had no children till she died. Okay. Same Mishal, same Bible, except now we're in 2 Samuel in 21.8. Whom she bore, Saul had five sons of Mishael, the doctor, daughter of Saul, whom she brought up as Adriel, the son of Brilai. And he thinks this is a contradiction. Again, just because he doesn't know the story. Because in the Bible story, David's wife, Michal, is given to another man. And she has five children with that other man. Okay. Then she eventually is given back to King David. And when she's back with King David, they get in this big fight and he totally tells her off. And when he tells her off, the Bible tells us that as a result of that, she had no child until the day she died. Now, what's interesting is this pastor presents no textual evidence for anything. No, no, nothing from the Bible itself. He just makes it up. I, I challenge him to bring us a text in the Bible chapter and verse that says Michal, she was married to a different man, had five children, and then got married to David and had no children, and she still had the five children from her first marriage. No such verse. He's making it up. What does the actual Bible say? And it's in the same chapter, 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, if you look at the 
first reference we will give is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 23 on your screen. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. That's all it says. Nothing about a second marriage, nothing about anybody else. No children till the day of her death. Now, you tell me, if somebody gets married and she has children and then she marries somebody else, and then she dies, would you say she had no children? Well, obviously you're going to say she had children. Till her death, she, she did have children in her life. This clearly states she had no children till the day of her death. Not particular husband, none, right? In the same chapter, 2 Samuel, when we go to chapter 21, Verse 8, it talks about the same Michal the, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, same Saul, same Michal. She had five sons. Now, the interesting thing is, here this pastor sees a clear contradiction. If you have had five children, there is no way you can say you have no children till the time of your death. Right? So he makes up this little story. And a different pastor made up a different story. They said she adopted them. <laughs> Right? Well, which one is it? Where is the textual evidence for what you're saying? You don't have it. Because you're making these up to try to cover, to hide these clear contradictions. In the end, we simply don't know. In our videos, and you can watch the other videos, we have given clear numeric age differences, contradictions in the Bible. And it is because, as you said, different authors. None of those authors are God. These are not the words of God. They're the words of men. And the words of men will contradict each other. But the Qur'an is not the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Not the words of the companion. These are the words of Allah, our God, our Creator. And that's why you don't find a single contradiction. And this is an encouragement to those pastors and preachers. Don't lie to your people. Don't make stuff up. If there are these clear contradictions, admit them. And to everybody else, pick up a Quran. A book without contradictions, a book without these kinds of fallacies, a book that wasn't authored by 39 people over 1600 years in three different languages, but a book revealed directly from our Creator, the words of our Creator, sent as a guidance for me and you, how to live, a spirituality, how to function as a society, all of that can be found in the Qur'an. So I encourage everybody, at minimum, get a Qur'an and read it. Open your heart, open your mind, and read it, and let the guidance flow through you, guide you towards the truth.